Uh, I'm Keith Klein, the founder of Venture Fizz. I have Gillen Hawks with us. She is one of the top top product leaders in the tech industry and obviously located in the greater Boston area. So Gillen, thanks so much for taking the time to join us here. I am thrilled to be here. It's always been such fun whenever we do anything together. And uh, Venture Fizz stuff is is really a great um, you know part of, of the community here in Boston. So super psyched to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited because this is our third event. So the first event we did was with Paul English. Second one was with Matt Kaplan. So this is the third event that's supporting our new communities initiative. So uh, with Venture Fizz, it's always had this place uh, of connecting you know, tech ecosystems together. But ironically, there wasn't an actual way to connect with other people. It was a destination website where you'd look for jobs and explore companies and all the great things happening in the tech industry. But there was no physical way of connecting people. So the community's product that we've launched is doing just that. So it's helping people build their network, grow their career, learning shared knowledge, access to super high quality events like this, and then uh, community only events that we have, which we're hosting our first one this month. And we're going to be doing a um, in-person event uh, come the fall. So more information about that will come soon. And this has been all geared around product management. Uh, the reason why is my background. I was a recruiter focused specifically on product management. So I started there just to help build this. And eventually I may roll it out to other functional areas like sales or software engineering, customer success. We'll see. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to talk a lot about different product areas, the whole theme of what we were talking about, of uh, the title of this whole talk was early product market fit to a hundred million ARR, which when I hear that, it's like, that's a dream for any entrepreneur to get to that level. There's some rapid fire questions that are just more like icebreaker gets to know you questions that I love. So All Dylan, right. what, what, what was your very first concert? Oh my goodness. Um, i.e. like me performing or me listening. I assume it's me listening, listening. As, as an attendee. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was a really bad little singer when I was about six. Um, I think it was Billy Joel at Madison Square Gardens. And what? At I, Madison Square Garden? Yep. Yep. That's legendary. Um, <laughs> he, I mean, and look, he is legendary. He's like still there or just was there. So I always want to there that. like always. It seems like he has a, like a residency yeah. or something. <laughs> And I remember uh, what I was wearing, Keith. It's it was a Patagonia fleece that was like you know one of those like ones. Anyway, I it's it's all very clear and it was great. I love live music. I actually went last weekend uh, with my husband to see Dave Matthews. Um, oh, very right cool. Down, out of here in Boston, so yeah, live music is awesome. Started with Billy awesome. Joel. All right, that's a, that's an iconic first concert. Uh, beach or mountains? Oh, excuse me, I can't have but mountains. I must say, okay. mountain. Okay. Love mountain biking. Early bird or night owl? I wish I could say early bird, but I'm a night owl. And I actually, I was reading just last week that like night owls apparently are like perform slightly better on certain things than early mm -hmm. birds. So I've always felt bad about being a night owl because I was like, oh, all those people get up and are super productive. Well, you know, mm -hmm. now the data says I don't have to do that. So <laughs> there you go. Okay. And favorite activity out of work? Ah, uh, I gotta be running. Yeah, I'm a runner. Okay. There's my head. Okay. Adds a ton to uh, to my peace and calm. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna run through a bunch of topics with Gillen, but if you do have questions and you wanna chime in in the chat feature, just add them in. I'll try to weave them into the, the conversation. There's like a Q and A piece too that I'll look at that too. But if you wanna, I think just the chat feature seems to be the easiest, but um Let's give a, a quick overview for people that aren't familiar with your background. Just give a quick overview of your progression of your career throughout uh, yeah. where you've started and where you are today. Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess my whole career has been in some shape or form in commerce, right? Um, and I wish I had some like, uh, you know, some strategy around why and how I got to commerce. I didn't like most of us. I kind of just stumbled into it. Um, and started out uh, for the first kind of half of my career, I worked in e-commerce for large, large enterprise retailers uh, in the UK and here in the US for like Home Depot and Staples. And I was doing always digital project ma product management and building kind of 
online bypass experiences and then ladder in, in omni-channel experiences, those kind of digital physical mergings. Um, and then after about 15 years of doing that, I was like, I can't do this again. I can't just move to another large retailer. I really want to do something very different. Um, and lo and behold, about 10 years ago, I jumped with both feet right into the startup scene right up here in Boston. And I joined my first startup and I've never looked back. And that's those startups have all been really in service of commerce. So building SaaS platforms and robotic solutions for in service of commerce Um either in a warehouse or in the transportation space. So I, I started out the front end of my career in the top of the bypath, and then I'm ending it and I, where I am now is at the end of that kind of commerce journey in, this, in the kind of part that often gets neglected, but thanks to COVID, you know, supply chain and logistics has just blossomed with the, the amount of um, investment needed and the amount of um, kind of technology and solution opportunities that are there. And so I'm leading part into that. Very cool. All right, let's get right into it. So when we talk about the title of this, this webinar, Zoom topic, it's early product market fit to 100 million ARR. So, so what does that mean, right? Like you're a founder, you've got something here, maybe you've got investment. And then we're talking like, how do you eventually scale to get to that level of, you know, that type of run rate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, if I were to pick one word <laughs> that kind of will will hopefully make that journey successful, or even if you don't make it to 100 million key, like just, you know, 50 million is a huge, huge milestone in a business. And, and there's a lot <laughs> that can, you know, a lot of lots of uh, sweat, blood and tears to get you to that. But um, I think the key to all of that is focus, <laughs> right? Stay and stay, pick something. Um, and maybe you don't pick the first thing the right time, the first time that's okay. Um, but if you focus on one thing and stay narrow to start with and really make sure you're getting, you know, positive and or negative feedback from your users early and quickly, that will either reaffirm that you're on the right track or it'll give you something to pivot to. Um, or, and so getting and staying narrow is really hard, um, because there are, when you are in a new space, there's so many places to go. Um, and that's really, uh, can be a dangerous and tantalizing thing to do, but it is a product leader's job to, um, uh, make sure that you are narrowly focused on a, in a, on a probably a single problem to start with. And a great example of that would be when I joined a um, uh, warehouse automation and robotics company called Six River Systems. Um, you know, the, I joined as the first product person. There was an early robot, V1 of Chuck. Chuck was the name of our robot. And um, so we were, A, focusing on a warehouse collaborative robot in a warehouse context. And the workflow and the first piece of SaaS that we built was simply one of the workflows that happens in a warehouse. And it was to pick items um, efficiently. And, you know, we perfected, you never perfected, but we stayed focused on that single kind of use case. And then from there, over the five years, we built out a full SaaS platform to handle all of the workflows and automate and optimize those workflows in the warehouse, dozens and dozens. But we started narrow and we actually were able to use pieces of those workflows and the knowledge and, and some of the automation on the, on the robot to really quickly add those new additional workflows. But the key to it was staying focused. How do you know when to start to add other layers to you know, the solution Good question. set? Um, I think you, you, first of all, the, the, the idea would be don't start to add until you think you pretty much got it, um, on that first one and not in, and, you know, there's, there's examples. Another example I would use probably in, in a counter example of this was at another, um, uh, an AI, uh, uh, startup that I worked with and we were solving a different problem, but essentially it was using AI to drive out recommendations that users were then, you know, going to be, um, you know, using to, um, solve their problem. And we proved early value of those recommendations because the math showed that our AI was did it better and more quickly um, than a person. But what we we didn't achieve kind of, I would say, we validated there was value there and that we were could solve a problem. But we didn't actually get user penetration and adoption the way that you need to, to say you have 
product market fit because we actually we saw usage go up and down and up and down. And we realized after talking to our users that they liked what they were seeing, but they didn't understand the logic behind the AI. They didn't trust it. And therefore, they weren't consistently adopting it. Right. So we we didn't I would say we didn't have product market fit on the UI portion, on the data visualization um, and the GUI um, right off the bat. We knew there was value, but we had to enhance it and, 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 and drive that, you know, those interactions consistently. So I would say watch for adoption and, and key KPIs that you're measuring your product um, against. And we'll come to that in a you know, discussion in a minute um, and make sure that you're hitting those KPIs and be honest with yourself if you're not. It's too early to pivot. It's too early to expand. Now, as you're scaling, what what did you find most critical? Um, you know, to in terms of partnering with maybe sales, because obviously you need sales to drive that hundred million or fifty million ARR. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sales and product. I mean, I see product at kind of the net. You always think of product as is the kind of nexus and close partnerships with engineering. Of course, there has to be. Um, but I think products, you know, when done really, really well, sits right in between go to market and engineering and right. And is that kind of synthesizing function and, and, and go to market is critical for all those demand signals that they are hearing in the market. Now, product has to go out and do that on their own research on that. And, and marketing does as well. But so always be listening to that, to what your sales sales teams are telling you is opportunity and where you're falling short. Those are great um, pieces of information. But more importantly, you know, they are, you have to enable them to sell your product with confidence, right? And, and believe in the product that you're out there, that they're out there selling. The hardest job is to get someone to buy things, right? And to part with their precious money. So you really have to partner closely with the, with the um, um, go-to-market teams on talking to them about benefits and impacts. Um, and build the assets that they need, coach them, train them, and actually participate in some of those sales activities so that you are helping them sell. And that's often neglected because a lot of PMs really like the build and getting into it and with the engineering teams, but it's critical. Um, I, I call the, uh, you know, I call their bookends of product management in my mind, you know, in the middle, you've got the, 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 the ham and the cheese, right? That's the build stage. Everyone knows that you've got to have, have that stage, but the bookends, if you will, or I guess the sandwich, you know, bread, I guess if we're on that analogy, is up front, you need to do decent, really good discovery and definition of the problem and then the size and the opportunity of, of what you want to do, what, what investment you want to make. But the second bookend, the later bookend, is that engagement, that sales enablement and that driving adoption um, and monitoring performance. And all of that is done in close, close partnership with um, go to market um, in, in all of uh, all the things that you're doing. There's actually a question that I think, you know, I'd want to talk about now instead of waiting. So how do organizations know they have product market fit? How do they demonstrate that to leadership? So the leadership part we're going to talk about, but like, like, how do you recognize it? Like this, other than the obvious, like, oh, people are starting to buy this. Like, but sometimes you get like false signals, right? Like false you know, mm -hmm. market, like some sales initially that gives you optimism yeah. only to find out it's not. Yeah. I mean, I think adoption has got to be one of the biggest ones. Um, I think also that customers are and it actually going to uh, let's just jump into KPIs because I think that's, that's a kind of critical part of it. Um, thinking about uh, how you're going to met when you're a PM right at the beginning of, of kind of the product development process, when you're building that business case, you've got to in that business case articulate what KPIs you are going to move the needle on, right? And, I don't, and I'm not talking about the like internal KPIs of, hey, usage, adoption, like feature functionality, engagement, and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about, in addition to those, the KPIs that you must have and you must hold yourself and product teams accountable for are the KPIs that your end users, your customers are going to be assessing the value of your product with, right? So if they are obsessed with, um, I don't know, like um, add to, if they're obsessed with uh, pick rates in a warehouse, if they are being, you know, rewarded and their, their job is to drive, you know, velocity and efficiency in the warehouse, you need to make that a KPI of your product that you are keeping your eye on at every moment so that you can under, because that's how you're going to be judged by your users and how your users are going to be judged by their bosses and their bosses' bosses, right? So you need to have your finger on the pulse of 
those KPIs as well. And so going back to your question about how do you know your product market fit is because those KPIs will prove that you are solving a problem and that you are moving the needle on metrics and that are important to that business, whatever the business is. Like, because we're kind of talking about the KPIs, um, how do you know what to measure? Yeah, I mean, as I say, I think it's a combination of understanding your what your end users are being comped on, right? So for instance, like, you know, in a warehousing context, you are your users, and I'll just use the example from, from you know, automation, warehousing, and robotics. It was, hey, how much volume is going through the building per labor hour, right? That is a metric that is you know, efficiency metric, one of several. That is, you know, how your product, where your, what your product is solving for. Um, and so that is a key metric. Whereas if you're, in, you know, I, there was, you know, in a different context in a, for instance, a store environment, a store associate, when I was building on kind of omni-channel capabilities for retail stores, one of the metrics that we measured for, for our buy online pickup in store um, product was when a customer came in to pick up their product, um, did they have an attachment sale that they picked up something else in the in the store at the same time? So that metric of an attached rate was very, very important to that end user. And um, the whereas associates um, were obviously not interested at all or comped on attached sales. So you need to know the problems you're solving and the context you're in. And those will be the KPIs that you need to be um, uh, making sure that you're continually moving. That's the other thing, like there's got to be continuous growth. Um, and that's where the kind of continuous value um, that you need to, you know, continually deliver in a SaaS platform. You can't just kind of get complacent. Um, you, you're always going to be asked to do more for your customers um, because they're always being challenged with business dynamics um, that that are that are changing around them. Well, what I think is, Interesting about your background, you talked about, you know, your experience being very commerce driven, yet you've worked across so many different types of products. Like you were working for Staples as a large retailer, then you went more startups and SaaS, then robotics, right? The complexity of building a warehouse robotic system that has hardware, software, there's so much involved. Um, and then, you know, that company was acquired by Shopify, right? So you saw things from, you know, an acquisition point of view, but so when you're building these types of complex products like how, how did you know how to do this and you know working in that multi-product portfolio like how, yeah. how did you all bring that together um you know this goes you know port a product portfolio is only after you have uh, really gotten the opportunity and scale to go and, and and break away from that really single single minded focus that I talked about in the very beginning. But even then it doesn't mean like lack of focus. It just means that you have a broader aperture and a broader space within your problem space that you're attacking. Um, you still need to stay focused, I would argue. You don't want to be off, you know, chasing um, you know, you know, new geographies or new verticals until you've really probably, you know, exhausted um, really what is right in front of you in your existing vertical. Um, and, and at that point, but that can be a portfolio of products at that point, right? Um, so as a company matures and as it scales, you know, the product is going to get broader and broader. Um, and I think one of the, the, the kind of key things to do is I, there's a very rudimentary kind of, but very effective um, kind of Tool that I find useful to engage leadership um, and executives on, and, and then I use you know all the time with with um, you know product and development teams. And it's it's a basically it's a high level resource allocation tool of like a very very uh, very sexy pie chart basically, right? And you know if you think of that pie chart as being your your development capacity, your roadmap, um, a very simple way to kind of think about how you're going to manage your portfolio um, is in three kind of areas. And I think there's a deep, this, these, this, these three areas can apply to virtually, I dare say it, virtually every type of product out there. As soon as I say that, I'm sure someone will come up with one that doesn't apply to you, but anyway, let's go with it. Um, and, and those three areas are really kind of strategic growth. Like these are areas that you as a business have determined and identified as new areas that you need to go into probably white space that is that is um you know critical for your business objectives right and remember your business objectives as a company flows down directly into the into the prioritization and the road mapping and and those decisions so um 
you know, it's a proactive 40% really of what you do at any given time should be about building new things to stay in front of your customers, to stay in front of the competition and to unlock new, new TAM, right? The other kind of piece of the pie chart or the pizza is, is and continually, we talked about it a minute ago, continually enhancing and adding value to your existing products, right? These are enhancements and extensions of what you've already got. Um, because nothing is ever done, really. You know, there's always going to be new technology and new innovation that you can bring to something you've already built. Very, very important to keep that fresh and keep that going. Another pocket of investment of your portfolio, right? And then the third is, I, I always do this when I talk about it, because it really is, it sustains both of those two things. And this is things, these are investments that are about supporting scale and building a solid foundation so that you are, you know, a robust, resilient, scalable, extensible um, SaaS portfolio product. So, you know, roughly take, take this this 40, 40, 20. So 40% growth. And, and that's the stuff that everyone gets excited about. It's the shiny things. It's that it's the marketing headlines. Then there's the 40%, which is around retention. And, and that is all about, you know, continuously enhancing. And then there's a very important piece that gets neglected often, but is very, very critical. And your engineering partners will be, will be very supportive of you investing at least 20% in that kind of foundational um, kind of pipe data pipelines and internal APIs and tech debt and, and all those kinds of things that are really important. So if you can align around where you're going to shift from that 40, 40, 20 for a particular reason, like if you have to know you need to enter a market or you really want to enter a market and you need to dial up that 40% um, you know, strategic growth to like 60% for a quarter and dial back in the other areas of the portfolio, do that knowingly, right? Doing do that deliberately and and revisit that mix every quarter um, to make sure that you are investing, you know, in a balanced way across your portfolio. All right. So uh, I guess the inverse to this is like, how do you prioritize? Like, I think of the different companies you've worked for. I'm sure there's a lot of like, wow, we can have this do this now, or you know. So it's like, how do you prioritize? You know, once you do start to think about, you know, expanding the portfolio in terms of a feature set or different product yeah. offerings, um, yeah, yeah, you, know, I mean, you probably have... Yeah, I mean, there are tons of frameworks, right? I mean, I think there's, um, you, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, like, you, you know, you have a probably arguably about a, you know, probably have a two or three year company kind of business objectives, right, um, that you always are going to be grounding yourself in and, and um, checking on the progress towards those goals. Um, and the roadmap really needs to be aligned and deliver to those goals. Um, you know, if you want to expand into a geography, there are lots of things that need to go on that are not product related, um, but there's certainly activity that will need to go on in the roadmap to achieve that. And that's a proactive growth investment that you need to make. Um, and so at the highest level, you are prioritizing based on your business objectives. Um, but when it comes down to then, how, hey, what, you know, what are some of those more concrete opportunities? Um, you know, typically, you know, it's a very, you need a very quick and easy, you know, rice is a very common one, a, a framework to assess the, you know, essentially the relative benefit and the impact and the value versus the relative investment um, needed. And, uh, you know, some people have rice, some people ha hate it. I actually kind of hybridize rice into my own framework. And I strongly encourage you to do that because, you know, no framework, no framework um, is, is um, perfect, first of all. And second of all, you know, the, the size and scale of your business and or um, um, your customer type or the type of product that you're building, um, you know, be smart about it. Don't be a slave to these frameworks just because they're out there. Use them. And it could be that you're, you know, in a smaller, more agile company and you need a lighter weight framework than, than, a, than a rice framework um, or, you, or you don't. So I think you really kind of take those frameworks for, for what they are and, and just say, my, my view is you need a framework. You need a way to, to help your PMs um, quickly prioritize and assess things. And you need to be very transparent um, across the whole business about that framework. 
um, so that everyone knows what's going on, so that it is not a black box as to what decisions product is making. That to me is it can be a very, very grave error um, when when you know product is is perceived to be off huddling in a corner with or without you know engineering and making quote all the decisions and coming back and and saying here everyone you know go sell this and go market this and you know you know my one of my strengths is that I am highly collaborative by nature. I think most product managers need to be. Now that doesn't mean you can't also have very strong opinions and be very you know in very good at influencing folks. Um, but to me, you need to be doing it in an open, transparent, uh, inclusive way. Um, because if not, people feel will tend to feel excluded and more angry and less likely to get behind, you know, what you what it is that you are trying to advocate, right, at the end of the day. A uh, great question here about your, um, what, like, what did you do to alter rice? Like, what was your hybrid approach for your rice um, I think I got more into, um, you know, when it came to, in some areas, it was uh, like, especially with when you're dealing with hardware and soft hardware in addition to software, and most folks don't know too much about hardware, but the idea, I think it illustrates it, is, is that, you know, you need to take into account a, a, and go a lot deeper into, hey, what's the level of investment needed from a time as well as a CapEx um, and, um, sorry, not CapEx, ca you know, um, what is CapEx, sorry, uh, capital, I mean, as well as the complexity of a sort of projects as well. So like, don't click into the, the concepts of rice and think about what that means. And, the, and you know, a great example was just that, like for hardware, you need to change it and tweak it and, and customize it for a hardware type of product because there's just other um, considerations that must be taken into account. Yeah, like manufacturing, that must have been really a challenging piece of like, okay, we we're selling this and we need to build it and then manufacture it and deliver it and install it. <laughs> like, install it. Uh, and then you need to, I think, um, as I said, when I uh, first joined, we were on V1 of Chuck. Um, and uh, by the time, you know, the, the, the acquisition happened and then beyond, and uh, we got to V6 of Chuck. Right. So we had six um, versions of Chuck, um, all of them. You know, some of them were slight variations. Some of them were pretty seismic changes. And so what you need to also be dealing with not only is kind of like, hey, again, going back to the, our, our sales partners, like how can you sell the, you know, how can you sell the, the, the old one when you know anyone's coming? It's kind of like that iPhone thing. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do with the old iPhone? What do you do with your old Chuck? How do you know what's the life on that? How do you, you know, sell through as much as you can of your existing inventory before you start selling the new one? It's a, it is a major complication. And thank God there are people smarter than I am on the supply chain team. And it's some of the best ones in the business worked on that, um, but very close in partnership with um, with uh, product and engineering. I mean, that's another another you know thing is building hardware and software. Um, anyone who's done that before will smile. When I hopefully when they when I say that they're very different cultures in those two different um, teams. Like everyone is singularly obsessed with um, you know being super innovative and um, and you know passionate about solving problems. Um, but very different in terms of how you go about doing that. I mean, hardware needs to be very, very, you know, there's no chance in hardware to kind of redo. Like in software, you're kind of like, oh, you know, two weeks sprints, we can, you know, anything we get wrong, we can pretty much fix. Hardware, that's not the case. You know, you need to be very, very, very deliberate and build optionality in as much as you can into the future. So two different mindsets there as you build things and the joy of and the challenge of automation and robotics is that you need to bring those two cultures and those two teams together to, to you know, to, um, you know, work on a timeline and a project and a roadmap that is, um, you know, very interdependent yet very independent. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember, uh, you know, trying, making sure that, you know, at Six River, those teams were brought together and, and, you know, there were some awesome people, we called them the glue, who really bridged those teams, you know, really talented um, TPMs who did a great job of, of um, you know, bringing uh, roadmaps and, and requirements gathering and, and triage together across both of those functions, both of those kind of two different types of teams. Um, and, uh, you know, really important to be, to be thinking about the differences and embracing those. All right, so so shifting gears a little bit. So, what's your philosophy as it relates to building and leading product teams? Um, you know, because 
you come in, you start to scale, you got to build more of a product function and hiring and, you know, yeah. like, like, so what, what's your philosophy around building a high performing product team? Um, I think, um, I would say, first of all, you need, um, there's the craft of product, right? That is knowing how to be a great product manager and execute, um, and collaborate with all the necessary, you know, um, dev teams and engineering and customers and, and design and everything. Um, so that's the craft of product. That's like the how you do it. Um, then obviously there's, in many cases, you have very deep and specific domain expertise, right? That you're solving problem in a certain space. My space is commerce. I, you know, so you need to have a combination of both of those things in a team. I, you know, ideally you have both of those things in an individual, but you can't, that's not always going to be the case. You might, you know, be waiting around for the unicorn to be able to find exactly, you know, someone who meets the, you know, the craft and the domain experience. So I, you know, um, loved working with um, folks from outside and I myself have been not a domain expert. Um, and, but I knew product management, I knew how to be a leader. And so, um, you know, you bring those things with you and then you learn, you learn the domain and how you learn that. Obviously, you know, I hope it doesn't, I hope, uh, you know, it goes without saying you spend time and time and time and more time still with your customers, right? And, you know, really um, walking in their shoes, um, literally, uh, <laughs> as often as you can to try and um, get that domain experience and accelerate that learning curve. I know that's certainly what I, I have done um, to, to, uh, to address that domain lack of domain expertise. Um, but at the same time, you can actually, um, you know, take someone who doesn't have any product management experience who has maybe been an operator. And so they know the they know their user like nobody else because it's them, right? But they don't really know how to be a product manager and to um, and you know to write requirements and to um, you know build business cases and things like that. And the great the great thing is is like as long as you are curious and passionate and a good communicator, I think that's the that's the like I draw the line. If you can't communicate um, and listen really well, you're not going to be a great product manager um, because that's a lot of what you do. Um, and you can learn the domain or you can learn the product craft, but having a, me a mix of those. Um, and I love coaching and mentoring PMs on either, you know, on either the domain, learning the domain or learning the craft. Um, also, my philosophy, I think, is is um, go is just simply we are all hopefully lifelong learners. I know that's like it's such a trite thing to say, but um, no one wants to be sitting still. Right. And, and the gray matter just needs to be exercised all the time. So, you know, I am all about giving people hard problems to solve and, and putting them in challenging situations that they might actually be scared to go into. Um, but you're never going to grow until you do that. Um, and what my part in the deal is to create those opportunities for those folks, give those opportunities to them, be it, you know, presenting their roadmap to execs or going into a QBR with a customer and talking about the roadmap or um, you know, public speaking or whatever it might be, put them into those stretching situations. Know that you they have your, you know, you have their back. Like if they stumble and they fall, that's great. You know, that's part of the learning process. So have their back, empower them, give them all the resources they need to go, and then just be a sounding board for them, right? And ask questions, nudge their thinking in different directions, right? People do that to me all the time. And that is exactly what will mean that you're delivering actually something that's better and better because you're getting a different perspective on it. No one, no one has a monopoly on, um, you know, the right way of doing things or all of the perspectives to look through. So you need the more lenses you have to be looking at a problem, the better the problem will be solved in my view. Um, and I guess just, you know, know, know as a product leader or know as a product manager, what your strengths are, right? What are you good at? And what aren't you so good at? No one is the finished final article. No one has all the skills they need. Um, so know what you're good at, try and learn, obviously expand those skills. But if you, you know, at the same time, surround yourself with people who have complementary skills, right? If you're not super analytical and don't really love data, that's okay. You need to have a respect for data, but you might need to, you know, get an analyst on your team to help you, right? And with the data side of things. Um, and so know what you're good at and know what you're not so good at, work on it, but also augment yourself um, so that you, you um, you are getting the best results, uh, you know, you possibly can. 
and and uh saying thank you right <laughs> yeah that was my little one you and I talked about this before um yeah I started doing that a while I mean saying thank you of course it's just a common decency but um it, this is genuinely true and, and folks at Six River can attest to it like I made a pledge a couple years ago to myself and it was after listening to some podcasts and I've got, if I cannot remember which one it was, but I swear I'll find it and, and send it to you, Keith. Like it was um, something about, it was about your personal brand basically as a leader and every leader is different. Right. And um, one of the things that is important to me is that people feel recognized and appreciated. And so what's a great way to do that is to say, thank you. Right. And so, um, and I don't mean like, you know, thank you in like large, large company meetings and stuff. I mean, thank you, like a quick note to someone. And so before a couple of years ago, before I sh closed my Slack down, shut my computer down, um, I made it made a decision to every night quickly Slack someone and say thank you. And it, you know, it wasn't thank you for launching that amazing million dollar project. It was more like, hey, Keith, thank you for asking that really insightful question. Or, hey, Keith, Thanks for acknowledging that Jeff hadn't contributed or really talked in that meeting and maybe didn't feel comfortable and you directly kind of in a nice way said, hey, Jeff, what do you think, right? So saying thank you for the big things and the little things is a great way to end your day. Um, and it's a great way for someone else to um, know that they've been seen and heard and appreciated. And it also builds your internal network. If we're all working remotely. It's just a great way also just to have a kind of a human connection virtually, obviously, with someone um, every day. Um, and so that's my little, that's my little people I, management. I love it. I love it. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good, powerful thing. Um, okay. So we've talked about this a little bit, but I want to kind of talk about it a little bit deeper. So when you're working with founders, CEOs, or the executive leadership team, and you're you know, there's visions, there's um, debates, you know, you're building out the product roadmap strategy and, you know, you got to say no, you got to be the front facing strategic person. So there's a lot that goes into working with teams and like, like, how do you ultimately work with, you know, founders and executive leadership teams yeah. when maybe there's a conflict of, of opinion of what, where to go and, and head next? Yeah. Um, I think one of the, one of, you know, often, I mean, of course, sorry, not even often, all the time, you know, founders by definition have a vision, right? That's why, why they're a founder. Um, but I think what, um, I think what is often very, is not often, it is imperative to make sure that as a product leader, your part of your job is to make sure that that vision that your founder has um is backed by voice of customer, right? Is backed by actual feedback from the customer because um, all, number one, I think it, it helps with what you just said, Keith. What if people disagree, right? Like what if there are two co-founders or three co-founders or whatever, or the leadership team is kind of like disagree. What a great, what better way than to come in and say, look, I've talked to our customers. <laughs> Here's what they've told us. Um, we can't ignore that. And so, hey, you know, folks over here, you're right, but you're not actually as right as the folks over here. And that's what our customers have told us. So take the kind of emotion out of it by making sure you're talking to your customers and trying to um, influence directions that way. I think what can also tend to happen, you know, and I'm, I'm not, in, you know, I'm including myself in this, is that you know, when you've been, you know, when you've been in the space long for a long time, you know, um, you sometimes believe your own myths, um, right? And so you, you you talk to yourself and a little bit of crowd think happens and, and all of a sudden you are talking to yourself more than you are talking to your customers. And so I would say, watch out for that, right? Watch out for leaders, founders, CEOs, uh, any anyone in a business who's like, yeah, well, I know the market and this is the way it is. Um, first of all, their information might be out of date. Second of all, their opinion and their interpretation of the market needs to be validated by customers and making sure that that is the case. And um, so I would just always say voice a customer, voice a customer. And linked to that would be 
using OKRs, right? Um, very effective. Um, sometimes smaller companies shy away from them, but I think they're very, very useful to make sure that you're staying aligned behind that vision and you are making progress towards that vision in a very kind of objective way. Um, so I would say, you know, product folks need to make sure that the KPIs line up to the OKRs and the OKRs line up to the, to the product vision and the, ultimately the business um, objectives, right? So make it, measure it, measure it. The only other thing I would say is, is um, I mentioned it earlier, is um, you can't, product cannot be a kind of over in the corner black box. You've got to be, um, I maybe could be accused of being overly transparent and overly inclusive. Fine, I'll take it. Like I absolutely want to want to make sure that everyone feels involved in the decision. Now that doesn't mean that it's a democracy. <laughs> everyone has a say, but ultimately it is the PM leader's job to have a strong voice and to have done the work of talking to customers and building business cases and understanding the market and competition to have a very strong opinion around what we are going to work on and what the priorities are now and what the priorities um, will be, you know, pushed back to the to the end of the roadmap for further consideration. So, um, but bringing people with you through that thinking is very important. If not, um, you're not going to bring them with you, right? Um, they don't necessarily need to agree, but they need to understand, right? And I think um, I've said it once, it, it, uh, and I think it's true, like, if I'm disappointed, I know I'm doing a decent job if I'm disappointing everyone a little bit all the time or over a period of time, right? It means that, that you know, we are doing that balanced investment um, in a way that means that, you know, um, some quarter, you know, some deadline on something that sales is really passionate about might get pushed out because we need to work on some foundational tech stuff and vice versa, right? Um, that's the, that's, a product's job is to navigate that and to be very open and transparent about why. Now you always hear like, oh, product, you need to be talking to your customers, right? Is there, and maybe this isn't an exact answer, but just broadly speaking, how often should product leaders be talking to customers versus individual contributors in product management be talking to customers? Is there like just a general idea there? Yeah, I mean, I think always like voice that you can never get too much of it. And now obviously you have, you can't spend your entire time on getting voice to customers, but kind of always and often in drip feeding it. And it, in, it, when I say voice to customer, it doesn't always have to be, it, it spans the gamut of very kind of informal, um, you know, user sessions with your end users, as well as very formal kind of, you know, strategic quarterly meetings with, you know, senior folks. Uh, and you remember, you should be getting voice to customer not only from your users, but kind of from fun their leader, their boss and functional leads within an organization, as well as the executives, right? So you're not going to be getting on the phone with the executives once a month. You might be talking to them once a year or, or biannually, but your users, you should have a constant pulse on. Um, and some great ways of doing that is obviously, you know, advisor, you know, customer advisory councils. Some people love them. Some people hate them. We did them. Um, we started out really small at Six River Systems doing it. We had just a handful of customers, um, but it was great. It was intimate. It was small. And we had a mix of customers and prospects, which is a great thing, too, you know, to, to you know, the sales team loves to get um you know, prospects at those at those types of sessions um, because they're talking to people who are, you know, the, are going through the, you know, who've crossed that bridge and are already getting value from the product, you know, which is great. So really it's it's a, you know, formal, once a year, those large kind of formal events, um, very important, but also casual user communities, right? Where you can connect users to each other um, uh, on a kind of more bi-monthly basis or something like that is also just voice of customer. Um, and as well as just, you know, um, I remember, you know, it was really important. We had, you know, adopted a, a site um, when we were at, at Six River. We'd have warehouses and I, and I started a program where the PMs and their, and their kind of um, engineering counterpart would adopt a site and have to go there um, twice a year. Um, and so it was always, and they could always just kind of, quote, pick up the phone and call that site and say, hey, you know, I need some quick root feedback on something. Do you mind? Um, and so, you know, that type of closeness, just very ad hoc and very informal is also voice a customer, right? So it doesn't have to be like capital VOC. It's like little VOC, little, little lowercase VOC. Well, you might've like kind of hinted on this, but there was a question that someone prompted, like, like, how do you handle it when you're being blocked from talking to customers? Mm. Um, 
And I'm curious why you know, I'd like to understand, you know, why you're being blocked. Um, yeah. Is it because the customer's really unhappy or, or something like that? So first of all, I would, I would, you know, usually customers are, as long as it's um, not gobbling up to too much of their time. And remember when you really need to be respectful of people's time. So you need to be very structured in what you're asking them. Um, and so, you know, uh, but regardless, like um, I would say sometimes, um, you know, first of all, going on site, you know, if you can, right. If that's okay. If, if you're having trouble, be like, look, I'll come to you. Let me shadow you for a day. Let me buy a pizza for the team and, and I'll come, we'll have pizza. We'll eat. We'll, I'll just, I'll just be in the background. Like, um, you know, charm goes a long way as does pizza, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. in getting time with folks. Um, and ultimately I think people like to like to provide feedback. I mean, we're all, you know, we all look, look at like well, what, I, what I'm hearing here is uh, cause it was, it's a follow up. It's like, you know, if customer success owns the relationship and then the founders yeah. monopolizing the time kind of like mm-hmm. blocking product from doing what is important. Right. It's like other right. functional areas are monopolizing the customer's time. Got it. Well, I mean, I think um, often, yeah, sorry, great call out, you know, as a PM, you always should be working with your CS um, uh, on arranging those touch points, right? I mean, sometimes it becomes so it becomes so casual that you don't have to go through the CS every time. Um, but you should always be working with them and making sure because a it's useful to know what the temp of the customers like, so you're not walking into something. Um, the CS will, team will always know that um, and you know help you through that and guide you through it. Um, and the CS team probably wants to hear exactly what you're hearing as well. So the more people who can hear what customers have to say, the better you can do your job. If you're product manager, CS, engineering, super, super useful um, to be hearing. I actually have a, an anecdote around a, a, an engineer going to a warehouse and picking for the day, right? So, you know, imagine you're picking um, using our robot and um, the engineer came came back from the visit and it was like, came, it was back when we were in the office, came into my office. He's like, he's like, Gillen, I just got back from such and such a site. He's like, I'm going to go fix, you know, this thing, because basically what the guy had spent was three hours bending down to the lower shelf when he was picking. <laughs> and he was like. I now know, understand why that feature that you know the PM wanted to prioritize about you know uh, you know upweighting the the algorithms to be optimizing for more of a kind of ergonomically friendly um, put zone on the on the robot was so important. And so I just use that as a fun example of saying like the everyone should go and spend time with customers and walk in their shoes because light bulbs go off. Yeah. All right, let's uh, shift gears a little bit. So AI is everywhere, you know, and so I'm sure a lot of product people are figuring out or getting mandated by the founder of the board, somebody like, what, what's our AI strategy? So what, how should you be thinking about that as a product manager if it's not like core to where the company began? Well, what's AI again? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there are a million different definitions, but um, so I actually, I, there's a really funny quote when I was preparing for this podcast that I really wanted to say, and I'll, I'll credit, I can't, I can't take credit for it, but I'm going to give a shout out to my, my uh, friend, Sam Thompson, who's at Progress Partners here in Boston. And the quote that I love is that, um, and I'm going to read it off my screen. It says, Gillen, it, it, he's like, we're seeing more companies thinking of themselves as data businesses rather than mere technology companies. And to me, the word that like, oh my God, the word that really hits me on that one is mere technology companies. Because like, you know, how much time have we all spent, be, you know, as a retailer or as a supply chain operator, like becoming a tech company, right? Because you need to be tech forward. And so now it's like, oh, tech, easy. Like technology or like building SaaS product, super easy. That's like so year two thousands. Like we are all sitting on some some mountain, small, large, or extra large of data that we are collecting, um, and that is now the a, a whole new revenue stream and a whole new opportunity for for you to be figuring out what you're going to do with it. And that's where AI comes in, right? Like so, all of all of us are technology companies as well as data companies, right? Um, and you know. To state the obvious, like, you know, companies can monetize this data either just simply by using it to generate, you know, uh, AI 
um, insights and embed that into their core product. Or some cases you can actually, you know, monetize your data because it is a very specialized curated data set that might be very, very valuable to train specialized LLMs with. So like there's you using your data, enhancing it and, you know, curating it. And then there's others using and getting access to that data, which is, you know, yet another consideration. So, um, but turning for a moment, so to like, let's just take the use case of you're using it. You've got to figure out how you are going to take advantage of the data that you have within your ecosystem, right? Um, or you're going to try and figure out what data you need to bring into your ecosystem to be and have an effective AI aspect to your product. Um, and I think there's two things to really start you off with. And the one that is super, super most important is like, what and it's nothing new. It's like, what is the pain point? What is the opportunity that AI can solve for my customers, right? Like, you know, it has to be real. It it has to add value in a way that that really demands AI rather than just being solved in a different way or just, you know, using AI because it's the hottest thing in the world, right? So I, I would wager there's always some level of AI that can enhance your product, um, and, you know, the, the obvious one that everyone is starting to do is, is kind of the, you know, the chat bot aspect to it, but deeper than that, um, there's so much more to go for, but make sure you're laser focused on what, how you're going to enhance your core um, product or build a new aspect to your product with AI. So start again with one simple use case, focus on that. The second equally important thing is to be thinking about is, you know, the data and the infrastructure that will be needed for you um, to be successful implementing and building that AI product. You need to be thinking about that at the beginning, right? You need to be building a data in, you know, in, in just in integration and infrastructure and pipelines that are scalable and will be something that are is robust, scalable, extensible, et cetera, as you build out your AI strategy over time. So you have the luxury of, of doing it right up front. I would advocate at least thinking about that and making some smart decisions about that um, before you in, before you embark. Yeah. No, I, like some of the companies that I feel like AI is just being forced, like I'm a huge, like I've been using LinkedIn since the very, very early days. I was one of the, I think I was the first 500,000 users as a recruiter. I'm like, this is amazing. So I've been a very strong proponent of LinkedIn and I thought they've built a, an amazing company and uh, obviously they got acquired by Microsoft. But what drives me crazy is their AI use where everything has a prompt and it's like, so like all over the place unnecessary like everything that is posted on linkedin now has an ai prompt about something about that post and it's just like it's it's not the use case yeah. but anyways yeah. that, there's my rant i'm not going to keep ranting let's <laughs> let's shift let's shift gears so um lots of people out there are are hunting for for new job opportunities and um you know the the market continues to be kind of a you know, there's pros and cons out there. Sometimes I yeah. feel like it's getting better. And then the next week I might have a different point of view. So um, how, how, what recommendations do you have that people are out there, you know, searching for, for something new? Yeah. Um, it seems obvious, but I myself ran afoul of it. So I will um, hopefully help folks, you know, not make the same mistakes I, I've made as I've looked for jobs in the past. I think it's it's it, what I what I would say is I started out the podcast with, with the single word focus, and I think I'm going to bring us back to that word because what I would say is although it seems counterintuitive when you're looking for a job, mostly you're like, wow, I should cast a broad net and like every opportunity is a potential opportunity, and that's awesome. What I would say is resist that temptation. Focus. Know what you're good at. And especially in this market, right? It is, let's be honest, for it's it's a bit of a buyer's market right now. Um, and um hiring, which when what does that mean? It means that all that hiring managers can basically check all their boxes. And what I mean by all their boxes is amount of experience that you're, you know, let's just take a product manager. Like you've got an amount of experience as a product manager, you are got good leadership skills, you've got uh domain experience, you've got, you know, all of these, you know, 10 things that they're looking for. And in this market, they're going to look for you to check every single one of those boxes and some. So if all of a sudden you get they get to the like checkbox that says domain experience and you're not able to check that, 
someone else is, right? And so long-winded way of saying, um, focus on the domain experience, you know, domain or domains that you know well and lean into them because um, right now, uh, the unicorn that I talked about of the product manager who has the craft as well as the domain experience and all the leadership and all the bells and whistles um, in this market, that's what hiring managers are holding out for. So I did the same thing. I was like, oh, I'm going to start talking to people who are in like, I don't know, domains that I really don't know enough about because I was like, look, as a product leader, I can work in any domain. And that is true. You can However, I was the bridesmaid three times and the feedback <laughs> for me every single time was Gillen, you guys, you and your, the, the two people who are left in this race after, you know, talking to you, all M team candidates, they checked all the same boxes you did and they had domain experience and they selected that candidate. And that makes sense. And so, but in the past, you know, in the past couple of you know weeks and months, focusing down on a certain domain that you are comfortable in and can bring immediate impact, immediate credibility um, is very, very important. So narrow is better. Um, do not pivot. Do not, you know, try and convince folks that now is not the time, right? Hold that out for a different market and continue your growth. Um, just lean into something that you can just really come in and add impact very quickly to a business. Um, that would be my main piece of advice. And, and then just, ta you know, kind of mechanics is we all know networking. We all heard about LinkedIn a minute ago and we know, you know, venture biz community networking is, is your friend, right? And I am guilty of it. Uh, you know, I tend to dial up and down the networking. I'm made a commitment to myself that I'm going to net, you know, have low level networking all the time because it's, it's just the right thing to do. Right. And, and when you need it most, you can just quickly tap into it rather than trying to kind of restart the engine every time. Some people are just naturally very good at it and do it. And love it. I literally block time in my calendar to do it, which is if that's the forcing mechanism then that's great. Um, get involved, like go to virtual events, go to real world events. It's good for your own spirits as well, right? Like looking for a job can sometimes be just feel like you're the only one and it's isolating. Go out there, talk to people. It energizes you. You, you can learn things. You make great connections um, and help each other out. Like I think that's one of the most re re life affirming things about job searching is, is that everyone wants to help like literally keep everyone. I've reached out to total strangers, not even like connection to connection, literally just people who are interesting to me. And they gave me half an hour of their time. Like time is the most valuable resource we all have. Um, but humans genuinely are helpful, kind people. Um, and so, you know, do that and pay it forward because uh, uh, the shoe will be on the other foot at some point in time. Um, and keep yourself sane by exercising, sleeping. I journaled for a while. Who the hell knew that I would ever do that? But that helped me mm. too, to get my thoughts on paper and clear my head so that I could sleep well um, and try and enjoy it. Try and enjoy the journey. There will I'm going to double app. down. I'm going to double down on your networking comment because you need to be okay. networking all the time. It's not just when you're looking for a job because as we've known in different market conditions, the best time to find a job is when you're not actually looking for a job. Um, so you just want to be networked out there. The more you're growing your network, the more that exponentially you'll be seen and heard out there. So it's just not when you're all of a sudden decide to look for a new job, you start to light that up because then it's like you're reaching out to people that you don't necessarily have that connection to, uh, or at least as tight as you used to have. So you're always trying to grow your network and always networking. One question before we're going to sign off here in a minute, but the, um, so what's the division of product marketing management versus product management. You know, some companies view them, you know, kind of one and the same, but like, what, how do you divide those two in terms of your overall philosophy and, and those two buckets? If there is, if it's, yeah. it's smallish company and there is no marketing team, then product, product marketing sits firmly within product to both, you know, articulate the, you know, uh, articulate the benefits, write up any kind of assets and create all of that marketing activity um, that, you normally would be generated and would be you know, a partnership with marketing. But in a moment, I would, the way I think about product marketing is the product team is accountable for, for creating the ingredients that goes into what the beautiful cake and marketing assets and campaigns that marketing creates in partnership. So product managers 
know the best things that, you know, they know the specs, they know everything that, that you know, benefits, competitive differentiators, et cetera. All of that comes from the product team. And then if there is a marketing team, that, then they work collaborate together on to, to create those um, marketing, you know, the product marketing. But um, if there isn't, then it's all in product. And that's, it's um, part of that kind of upfront bookend, uh, sorry, the backend bookend of product management of launch, drive adoption and monitor is in product marketing is a huge part of that. So. Well, kill it. well, thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through all the details of the topics we covered. We covered a lot. This will get recorded and sent out to everyone or it was recorded. It's going to get sent out to everyone. I added some links to my LinkedIn. And if you are a PM, that's not part of our community. You can re request an invite. So the URL is there. Gillen, thanks again for taking the time. We appreciate everything you shared. Oh, thanks, Keith. Thanks for inviting me. And um, really love being part of the VentureVis community. Appreciate it.